At this time, we're back on the record. In the case of State of Wisconsin vs Stephen Avery case number 05CF381. We're here for a continuation of closing arguments this morning. Will the parties present state their appearances for the record? Good morning, Judge. The state appears by Calumet County DA, Ken Krabs. Assistant Attorney General Tom Fallon. Assistant DA, Norm Gahn, appearing as special prosecutors. Good morning as well. Stephen Avery is present again, and Jerome Buting and Dean Strang standing for him. All right, before we bring in the jury and continue with closing arguments, there was one matter I wanted to clarify for the record. During the course of these proceedings, we have had some individual error with the jurors, and I wanted to clarify the court's understanding that neither party is asking that any of the jurors be excused for cause. Based on any information adduced at the voir dire, Mr. Kratz. That's correct, Judge. Mr. Strang. That is also correct. Very well. Is there anything else the parties wish to take up outside the presence of a jury before we resume the closings? No, Judge. No, sir. All right. We'll bring the jurors in at this time. You may be seated. Good morning again, members of a jury. At this time, we're ready to resume closing arguments. Mr. Strang will be speaking first on behalf of the defendant. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I, what's it been, five weeks or six weeks or whatever it's been, and the rules within which we operate fundamentally allow me only to speak at you. At this point, I would be ready to speak with you. I can't exactly, but I do want to do my best to talk with you this morning. Can't hear. It's kind of soft. Kind of soft. Which number is that? I'm number seven. I'm getting nods. You hear me? Whether you want to or not. I want I want you to step back just a little bit here and let's try to work at assembling a bit what you might do in approaching your task. And you have got such a mass of information, really, over the last five weeks, let's call it. There are some things you are not going to be able to do, I think. But there are also some things you can do. And I want to talk about what I see as the line between those things. You, unfortunately, are not going to be able to solve the murder here. And I say that for this reason. If Stephen Avery did it, if... If he's the guy who murdered Theresa Harbeck, then, then in a sense, you are not going to solve that. They already think that. This is the person they think all the evidence points to, the person they have identified as doing it. You can agree or disagree with that, with that, that theory of prosecution. But fundamentally, you and I aren't solving the murder because if Stephen Avery didn't do it, we can't tell you who did. You know, Jerry Buting, Jerome Buting, in court, you know, is not going to tell you, doesn't mean to tell you that, for instance, Bobby Dassey murdered Theresa Holbeck. It's really kind of a point. We don't have a police department. You don't have a police department. We're not going to be able to solve the murder if Stephen Avery did not do it. So, you know, you can agree with the state you can agree with the defence, but at some level you are not solving the murder as much as it's natural for all of us to want to do that. Second thing I think you are not going to be able to do, I'm quite certain you are not going to be able to do, is bring Theresa Hull back, back through that door, or better yet, back through the door of her mum's house. We are not going to be able to do that. Convicting a guilty guy, convicting the person who killed her, wouldn't do it. Convicting someone who didn't kill her certainly won't do it. The life that was before October 31st, 2005, never will be lost. It's etched in Mom's heart. It's etched in her brother's and her sister's minds, in their memories, in the people they are. That life is not lost. The life that could have been going forward, beginning November 1st, 2005, is forever lost. Not forgotten, but lost. This is human tragedy. 
And if you or I understood why people have been killing each other since we crawled out of caves, we would stop it. But someone killed this woman and that life going forward is lost. You can't get it back. I can't get it back. The gentleman at this table can't get it back. The other thing I think that you are not going to be able to do, you can't do, 13 people, 12 people can't do, is we can't provide closure here in any real meaningful way. It's not what courtrooms are good for. You would like to be able to do that for Teresa Holbeck's family. I think you would like to be able to do that for Stephen Avery's family. Provide some closure. Provide it for him. For crying out loud. You would probably like to do that too, if you could. But there again, time since November of 2005 really fundamentally is lost as a matter of closure for Stephen Avery. He's never really, in the broader public, been presumed innocent. He's never really had the presumption to which he was entitled as an American, as a citizen accused. You folks may be the only people in the world other than those of us at my table who do pre- presume him innocent. You can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about that for the rest of the world. And as I say, courtrooms are pitiful, pathetic places to try and provide closure for the Lawrence, closure for the Holbeck family. Not that it's not important that the system not work. It is important that the system work. Because when it works, we can provide justice or some semblance of justice. But justice and closure are are two different things. Nobody is always happy with justice or at peace necessarily with justice. And in that sense, closure would be something more, something more personal for that family and for this family and for Stephen. You would provide it if you could. I know you would. You won't be able to do it. And in some ways, you are going to be told that you ought not try to do any of these things because I think Judge Willis will tell you after the lawyers are done speaking at long last, I think he will tell you that you have got to decide this case as finders of fact without sympathy, without prejudice, without passion, without all the things that might go into solving murders or providing closure. You will be told instead that you won't, you can't, be swayed by sympathy or prejudice or passion. But there are some very important things that you can do here. Now that I have identified the things you can't, there are some very important things you can do. You can honour your oath. You can keep a promise that you made before the world, more importantly, that you made for yourself. You put your own conscience on the line. You can honour the oath that you have taken and that you will take as jurors. You can obey the oath. That's no small thing. You are under an enormous amount of pressure, internally and externally. This table, my table, a courtroom full of people, a community at large, terribly serious issues for everybody. So when I say you can honour and obey your oath, It's a big deal. You also can apply the law honestly and courageously, part of what you are duty-bound to do, as the judge delivers the law to you in the form of those jury instructions. You can apply that. You can decide this case, if you choose, on the evidence in the courtroom and only the evidence in the courtroom. You have the power to do that. You have a duty to do it. But more importantly, you have the power to do it. You get to make the choice to do that. It's something you can do. You can decide whether allegations have been proved beyond the reasonable doubts in considering all of the evidence. I don't take it for granted that jurors do that in the end, because jurors are all human, just like I am. But if you choose to do that, you can. It's within your grasp. And I think finally, you can, if you choose, you can get it right. But the limited parameters available to you, you can get it right. You can go home whenever you are done and say, I know in my head, because I use my head, 
I know in my heart because I used my heart. I know in my conscience because I listened to my conscience that I got it right. You can do that. And if you do, you will also have set it right. Just as I said I was going to ask you, when I spoke in opening statement, when it was about 19 below zero outside, or whatever it was that day, you will set a lot of things right, if you get it right here. The 1985 case won't matter so much anymore if justice is done this time. Will that ever go away? No, but it just won't matter so much anymore. The injustice that was done to Stephen then, because there is there is something redemptive in human beings going back and trying again and getting it right eventually. So I want to ask you simply to commit to doing the things you can do and to living with, reconciling yourself to the things you can't do. You are not going to solve a murder, a murder, but you may spare someone who is not a murderer. You are not going to bring Teresa Holbeck back to her family, but at some level, just by this trial ending, you can give her back to her family. What do I mean by that? I mean, for crying out loud, what's an artificial thing we do? And I love this. I love being a lawyer. I love it. But what an artificial, strange thing it is that we do here, rules of evidence, formal procedures. And for crying out loud, right down to taking body parts and putting exhibit numbers on them, explain a person's phone records on a screen for a room full of strangers to look at. It is what we do. It's what we have to do here at some level. Clinical discussions of death, dry discussions of who you are calling or who's calling you on your cell phone, just for example, it's important. It's necessary. But when this trial ends with a just verdict, Although you can't bring her back, in some ways you can give her back, you know. We can be past that and remember the Teresa Holbeck who was, rather than the 15 loci of her DNA. You won't give closure, but maybe, maybe you can create an opening. If not closure, an opening when we finish this trial for people to get out of these pews, out of these uncomfortable pews, go back about their lives And in church and in community and wherever, wherever the heck people hang out, in family rooms, there pursue closure. And the sense of restoration or reconciliation that we find or seek in places other than courtrooms with uncomfortable pews to sit in. So maybe as you finish this case, although you can't give closure, maybe you can give the opening for it. How do you undertake then to do the things that you can do? It's witnesses. It was helpful for Mr. Kratz to give you pictures of the witnesses so you can associate the face with the name again. But much more fundamentally, how do you how do you assemble and assimilate this mass of information and approach it in a practical way? You can't do it by hoping the DNA will tell you a story. You know, Unfortunately, for example, DNA doesn't tell stories. People tell stories. People have stories. DNA is submicroscopic bits of protein. Mine's a little different than yours, but you know, fundamentally, we're all about 99.9% the same, probably. Doesn't tell a story. It doesn't tell why someone did something. Doesn't tell when it got where it got. If a human being made a mistake with the DNA. It doesn't tell you anything at all about whether whether it should have been here or wasn't here or whatnot. It doesn't, in, it doesn't tell you a story, unfortunately, although it makes good rhetoric in a closing argument. So what you have to do in the end is you have to look at and listen to people here, even when they are talking about science or filling their, with their propane truck or whatever. In this process, to do your job, to do the thing you can, you have got to look at real intently on the witness stand and listen to people. And you have got to sort out who you believe and who you don't in the end. 
So I want to ask, at least suggest, that you ask two very basic questions here as, as a framework, a possible framework for getting at the things you can do here if you choose. First question, you know, he says he, he is innocent. Anybody can say they are innocent. Back at the time before you were around, before anybody was really looking at him, you might ask first, was he doing the things that an innocent person might do? As you look back at it, was he acting and was he behaving like an innocent man? That's one question you could ask, sort of approaching this whole mass of evidence. The second question you might ask yourself is, for the law enforcement professionals and the prosecutors, primarily the state employees and state witnesses, call them law enforcement people generally, the ones who were so convinced he is guilty back before they got here were, were they behaving as honest people acting in good faith do? You could ask yourself that question, again, a sort of a framework for approaching the mass of evidence. Back before they knew you were going to look at them, as you see it now, were they behaving honestly? Were they acting in good faith? Now these these are just two suggestions, just some lawyer's idea. You can go about this whatever way you want, but this might be helpful. And ask yourself, as to the folks who think Stephen Avery is guilty, do you believe them in the end and believe them to a level that you would not even pause to hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life? That's language right out of this reasonable doubt instruction that you got. And just taking a part of it, and it's sitting under your chairs, or whatever your instructions are, you don't have to pick it up and look at it now, but you will find that. I think it's a helpful practical guide in deciding whether something is proven, whether you believe it beyond a reasonable doubt. It's, you know, would you, given the information you have in the end, would you pause or hesitate in the most important affairs of life? There's no getting around that this is one of the most important affairs of your life, of your lives. A young woman is dead for no conceivable good reason, and a man is on trial for doing it. Enormous consequences. And Mrs. Holbeck and everybody who loved and cared about this young woman, brothers, sisters, friends, uncles, aunts, you name it. And to Mrs. Avery, whose own story is tragic, you know, and to the people who fought for his innocence, the handful of people who believed him before the rest of the world finally got it right, who went through all of that, Mrs. Avery, and then two years later to have this come crashing down on her. This is an important affair, and it is for you now, too. So, I start with my first question. Did he behave as an innocent man might behave? Let's go back. Go, let's go back to roughly October 2005. What is he doing? What is Stephen Avery doing? Well, he is living in a trailer that he borrowed from Rolly Johnson. That's pretty modest. That's a damn sight better than a prison cell that he had been in. He's got himself a girlfriend. He's working in a family business. This is all honest stuff so far. He has a lawsuit started for a whole lot of money based on he's got two indisputable points on his side in the lawsuit. One, he was innocent of the earlier case, but, you know, he rotted in prison for a while anyway. So, you know, he is innocent, but he went to prison. He's got pretty good starting points in a lawsuit in getting some money. And that's what he's got two other lawyers pursuing for him back in 2005. He's got his mum and dad back. I don't mean to be ignoring Alan, but when I speak of Dolores and anybody else, he's got his family back is the point. And as this, as this case starts to take shape, you know, as Teresa gets reported missing and they find out that she had a photo shoot out at the Avery property the very night 
November 3rd, she was reported missing. Sergeant Colburn comes out to the property, bumps into Stephen Avery. Stephen is not expecting the police. There's no way he would have even known she had been reported missing at this point. Bumps into Sergeant Colburn and he is cooperative. By Sergeant Colburn's own account, he is cooperative, open, talks to Sergeant Colburn. Doesn't say I'm not talking to you, you know. The next morning, same thing. Detective Remica and Lieutenant Link come out to visit him. He's cooperative. Cooperative to the point of saying, you can come into my house. When they ask, go ahead, come in my house. I think it's later, on Friday, November 4, when David Beach comes and, you know, has the poster. He wants to put the poster up. This is Teresa's relative. Nice younger guy who testified, I think, the first day of testimony. And David Beach has a conversation with Steve Avery and Steve is forthright. He's calm. He appears concerned, according to Mr. Beach. To me, this is useful, because at that point, he is not posing. He is not in a courtroom. He doesn't know how this is all going to play out. These, these are people who are seeing him real, if you will, just having, you know, encounters with him. And this is their take on what, on what they are getting from his behaviour and what he says. Is he behaving like an innocent man? Well, he has Theresa Holbeck's cell phone number. We get a glimpse of her. She's obviously willing to give this out. She says so in a voicemail message. She leaves her cell phone number on the voicemail message. They caught that, that she leaves on the on Yander voice or answering machine. And Steve has her cell phone number. He has got it written down in two places in his house. They are on his computer desk somewhere. They are there on November 5 when the police descend and the, the Avery people get excluded from the property. And the police have it for a week. They are there. He hasn't destroyed her cell phone number, hasn't tried to get rid of it. You know, it is there in not one, but two places. So, you know... I don't know if you can burn a cell phone and if you can burn an A310 digital power shot camera. I don't know why you can't burn two pieces of paper that have a cell phone number on it. That's not what he does, obviously. There was a van for sale. Heaven knows there was a van. You saw about 10 pictures of this silly maroon van sitting out there. Why, why do I, you know, why do I suggest that's evidence, if you will, of Steve behaving like an innocent guy would behave? Well, you know, if you are if you are going to lure the photographer to your property so you can have your evil way with her and kill her, you don't need a car. You don't need anything for sale. You just lie and say, you know, I want you to come out and take a picture of a 73 El Dorado or, you know, whatever it is. There's a van. It's the van he tells Auto Trader. It's owned by Barb Yander, just like he tells Auto Trader, B Yander, and gives B Yander's telephone number. Turns out there is no dispute, of which I'm aware. The Dassey boys, you know, Scott Taddick, the people who know about this, who testified, yeah, there's a van. It's sitting there. She's trying to, se she's trying to sell it. It's hers. I think that's suggestive of innocent behaviour, not of, you know, luring or concocting some schemes so that you can murder somebody. Look again, what's he doing in October and early November 2005 while he's still in his house? The gun's over the bed. Are they hidden? Has he, you know, has he run off and burned them or asked his nephew to take them and thrown them in the bottom of a pond or something? or even move them to the spare bedroom. No, the guns are where they are. They are right where Ronnie Johnson left them. Did he crush the car? No. Did he empty the burn barrel, trying to hide, you know, whatever it is in the burn barrel? Did he melt the license plate? Did he get rid of the key that supposedly is found, you know, next to the foot of his bed, or across the way from the foot of his bed? 
next to his desk. No, you know, he doesn't do any of that. I don't think the key is there. But if you believe that it's that it's there, you know, if you believe if you believe it's there, then it's awful incriminating if you believe he put it there. But you know, I don't know why he would keep the key and that key alone of all Teresa Holbeck's possessions if he has previously disconnected the battery so that the key won't work. Unless he reconnects the battery for some reason. And he's got a junkyard for crying out loud. Leave the key in the trunk where the keys are for all the other junk vehicles. Leave it in the ignition. Put it in the grass. I don't know. Bring that and that alone to your bedroom. But, you know, in general, the behaviour you are seeing from Stephen Avery on November 3 and November 4 is open, cooperative. Sure, you can search my house. Contrasted to the behaviour of a George Zipper up, who is one of the other appointments Teresa has that afternoon. Uncooperative, hostile, dishonest with the police, won't let him in the house for a long time, even after he knows this young woman is missing. You get this from, some of it from Joel and Zipper up, and some of it from, de- from Detective Rumika. How about burning trash, plastic smell? Burning trash is about, give or take, 3.45 on Monday afternoon. How about, well, that really sort of takes you to Bobby Dassey and Blaine Dassey and Lisa Buckner and John Lurkwin to decide what burning trash means. If Bobby Dassey is right and Teresa Holbeck has been there at 2.45, then burning trash at 3.45 with a plastic smell is potentially incriminating. Bob Fabian sees this, smells the plastic burning as well. That's potentially incriminating if Bobby is right. I'm wondering why Bob Fabian doesn't smell the quite distinctive odour of a burning tyre. You know, rubber burning with black smoke pouring thickly out of burning barrel if supposedly the tyre is being used to burn the cell phone, the camera and the Palm Pilot. But setting that aside, to me, there is a more fundamental problem with that. I don't think Bobby Dassey is right. You know, Blaine Dassey has a good reason to know when he gets off the bus every day. It's 3.30 to 3.40. He comes home, Bobby is sleeping. Bobby is there and he's sleeping. This is what his own brother remembers. More, the bus driver has a pretty good reason to know what time. She's driving the same route every afternoon, dropping off the same kids in the same place at about the same time every afternoon. She's no friend of Stephen Avery. She's not connected to Stephen Avery. She's not coached. She's not trying to oversell what she remembers. But that's when she drops the Dassey boys off. And one of the days that week, either Halloween or Tuesday the 1st or Wednesday, November the 2nd, she remembers seeing a female photographer taking pictures of a van. If facts are stubborn, as counsel says, then that then that's a pretty stubborn fact. Just because she's not overselling it and she has no reason to want to care how this case comes out, you know. So is it possible that some other female photographer was there on Tuesday, November 2nd, taking a picture of a van? Well, is it possible? Sure, it's possible. But even investigator Ligert concedes when pushed a little bit about that, that he doesn't have any information about another female photographer coming to take a picture of another fan. So this is pretty reliable stuff, that Teresa is there at more like 3.30 or 3.40, not 2.45. John Lurkwin sees a green SUV leaving. What does he care about Stephen Avery? For that matter... What does he really care about Teresa Holbeck? And he doesn't have he doesn't have a dog in this fight. What he has to do 
is sit and stare out of the front wheel windshield of his truck every day for half an hour, 3.30 to 4, quitting time as he fills the LP truck. He has got nothing to do except look at the world. Filters out the school bus, filters out, you know, the cars he sees coming and going every day. That's common sense. That makes sense. When something new goes by, it's not a heavily travelled road, he notices. Is he overselling the point? No. Can't say it's that SUV. Can't say it's a Toyota RAV4. Looks similar. Can't say he was driving it. Didn't see whether it turned right or left at the stop sign on Highway 147. You know, he's not gilding the lily, so to speak. He's not overselling what he saw. So, to me, you guys are the ones that matter. But to me, that's fairly reliable stuff. It's reported to the police, candidly, when they ask. Lisa Buckner, for that matter, goes up to the barricade that Saturday, says, I have some information maybe you want. They interview her two days later, you know, the following Monday, when it's fresh in mind, and she tells them what she knows. Tells them what she doesn't know, for that matter. So, you know, you've got Bobby stacked up against Blaine, Lisa Buckner and John Lurkwin, and it looks to me like the more probable time frame is 3.30-ish that she's there. And if that's so, then burning garbage in your burn barrel at 3.45 is just burning garbage in your burn barrel. It's innocent. Bob Fabian smells plastic. So what? It's a white plastic garbage bag that, you know, Blade sees. You've got plastic in your garbage, you know? I'll bet you do. Unless you live in town where you've got a nice blue recycling tub or something. And you can separate that stuff out. But this doesn't look like much. If the time frame is different, then Bobby Dassey has it. So how about how about the 4.35 p.m. phone call to Teresa's cell phone? what my colleague referred to as the alibi phone call. And the state argues he is doing that to create an alibi because he knows that will create a record on the phone call bills. Cell phone company records. Okay, all right. I mean, first of all, it makes the star six, seven calls not very important because they are going to create a record too. And if he knows a 435 call is going to create a record, then he also knows that the 224 and 233 calls are going to create a record. But maybe more importantly than that, this isn't much of an alibi. It's a cell phone. Calling a cell phone, you can be anywhere. Doesn't place you in any particular, you know, spot on the planet. It's not like you were at home in your kitchen because you called on your landline, you know, with a six foot cord keeping you from going any further. It's a cell phone. It's not a good alibi. You know, it doesn't get you anywhere or suggest that it's guilty behaviour. This call also draws more attention to you, not less. I mean, you are going to show up on the cell phone records. It is your cell phone you are using. It's not. This isn't something you do if you are trying to alibi yourself. But if, while we're looking at phone calls and moving through Steve's behaviour on October 31st, you know, hey, There are two telephone calls the state hasn't talked much about yet, if at all, but they stipulate on this. They agreed. There are two phone calls from the Manitowoc County Jail to Stephen Avery's landline. He's got a cordless phone. It may even be in one of the pictures in the bedroom, so he can wander around. But it is, you know, it is a cordless landline phone. They have stipulated. These phone calls come in from his girlfriend, Jodie, from the jail. First one is at 5.36 in the afternoon. 15 minutes of talking, tape recorded. Investigate a liger, has listened to it. And then another one at 8.57pm, tape recorded. Then listened to by the police. 15 minutes long, talking to his girlfriend. This is what somebody who's in the process of burning a body is going to be doing. Are you kidding me? You know, I mean... You think maybe you have heard these tapes played if there had been something incriminating or out of the ordinary about 15-minute conversations with the girlfriend that night. Halloween night? It's more 
just evidence of everyday life, doing what an innocent person might well be doing, and that's how October 31st comes to an end. Later that week, and I, you know, Blaine Dassey tells you this. He didn't make a big point out of it, but he told you, and I want to remind you about that. Later that week, Steve Avery suggests to Blaine maybe he wants to invite some of his friends over for a bonfire at Steve's place. Blaine's in high school. High school kids, bonfire, he makes the suggestion. It never happens. For whatever, I don't even know that Blaine explained why, but it just, the bonfire never happens later in the week. But, you know, if you had burned a body in your burn pit, or you even knew that there were bones in your burn pit spread around human remains, you were going to invite some high school kids over to have a bonfire and sit around the same burn area. I'm not. That doesn't seem to me that somebody who's guilty that that's something he would do. An invitation he would extend to his nephew. A bunch of random high school kids come on over to my makeshift crematorium for a bonfire and stand around. What does he do here in terms of behaving like an innocent guy or not? Well, look at the witnesses we called on his behalf. Now, all walks of life, many fewer witnesses than a state called. But as I say, all walks of life. And what struck me, at least, about the folks who testified for you, because we called them, is I thought to a person, these folks were natural. They were real. They weren't swivelling in their chair to look at you, to give you a talk, as if they were an old friend of yours every time they were asked a question. They are not advocating anything, as far as I could pick up. Or as I say, sort of selling you something, overselling something, They are candid on cross-examination, just as they were on direct examination. I thought, at least, that's what this group of people shared. Was I surprised that we had to call the bus driver, rather than the state calling to help you with the the time frame that afternoon? Yeah, I was surprised, but we did it, since they didn't. And now you've got that information. But, you know, these... These people rang true to my ear, at least, and it's your ears that matter. So let me move to my second question. Can you believe the police? Can you believe the law enforcement folks who are so sure that Stephen Avery's guilty? What do you see about their behaviour before they are on the stage here? Well, look at what they say and do when they don't know that you are going to be listening and seeing. Let's start with Andy Colburn since I sort of started with him on November 3. He calls in, does a licence check on Teresa Holbeck's car. He says he thinks it was probably on November 3. Not sure, but probably November 3, that he did that. But remember, he's working on November 3, so he, so he would have had his radio. And it's Detective Remica who says, ordinarily, you would use your radio when you are calling in a licence check to dispatch. He uses his cell phone instead. The tape you hear is clearly a phone call, not a radio in. So I think it's probably more likely that this licence check is November 4, when Sergeant Colburn acknowledges he was off. Didn't work on November 4. And you may remember, Mr Kratz asked him, do you remember what you were doing on November 4, 2005? He says, yes, I do. I was off. I remember what I was doing. Didn't tell you what he was doing, other than to deny he went to the Avery Salvage Yard or denied he had anything to do with planting evidence. But he is off. And I'm not going to play it for you again. It's in evidence. But let's see if this comes up. That's that's what you hear on the tape that we played. Sergeant Colburn. Lynn, dispatcher. Hey, Andy. Sergeant Colburn, can you run Sam, William, Henry, 582? See if it comes back to that. Da, 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 da. Then they start talking over each other. I can't make it out. You can listen to it if you want. Then she goes off talking about needing a Spanish interpreter. 
she, he chatting while well, she's doing the license check. She comes back and she confirms it's Teresa Holbeck's license plate, the missing person. Sergeant Colburn says, 99 Toyota, and so on. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is he calling in a license check on November 3 or November 4? Whichever day it is, you can get that information from Investigator Liger. Or if you want to call your dispatcher, ask the dispatcher. This sounds a lot like what road patrol officers do when they come across a stalled car, an abandoned car, a car where it shouldn't be, like the RAV4. That's what this sounds like. Draw your own conclusions. Obviously, look at it from any other piece of evidence. But what's important is he is doing this, not on a witness stand. He is doing this when he doesn't know anybody is going to be seeing or hearing or evaluating it later. Stay, move off Sergeant Colburn, but stay in the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department for a moment. Mr. Kratz argued to you yesterday, Special Agent R. Spender started November 5, devoted his resources where this thing was likely going, where this thing was likely going. True, I guess he did, in the sense that it was certainly clear, pretty quickly, where this thing, this investigation, was going. In my opening, and with Detective Remica, we had a chance to hear at 11.30 in the morning on November 5, half an hour after the first police officers arrived at the Avery property, there to, you know, see the concealed Toyota, that the Sturms had found half an hour later for you to hear at a time when he, you know, he wouldn't have known it. Manitowoc Detective Dennis Jacobs talking to his dispatcher. Can you tell me, do we have a body or anything yet? I don't believe so. Very next thing he says, do we have Stephen Avery in custody though? Yeah, it's pretty clear where this is going. By the time Special Agent R. Spender arrives, you know, at 2.25, three hours later that afternoon almost, it's pretty clear where it's going. Five minutes after this one, conversation. Mr. Strang, I'm getting a signal for a break, so we're going to take a short break and then we'll resume in 10 minutes. You may be seated. Let's report back at 10.15. Mr. Strang, you may resume. Thank you. So five minutes later, five minutes after Detective Jacobs called with the dispatcher. He is on the phone with Detective Remica. Or the radio, I don't remember now. But you got the tape in evidence. Of course, Detective Remica does testify, and you may remember him kind of presented himself as someone who thought they were barking up the wrong tree. That Steve didn't do this. When he testifies. That morning, just about an hour after the Sturms had first found the Toyota. Okay, other than the car, do we have anything else? Not yet. Okay, is he in custody? It's not who you are talking about. Who do you mean by he? Negative, nothing yet. One pronoun, he, and these guys know who they're talking about at 11.35 in the morning. Are these folks acting in a way that seems good faith and honest to you? Back then, six days after this, Special Agent R. Spender makes a telephone call to Sherry Colhane at the crime lab. Try to give her some direction. And, you know, she's holding herself out as a scientist. That's how she holds herself out. The Special Agent R. Spender asked for science on the exhibit that Mr. Butin showed you. Is he asking for science there? for a good cautious objective, let's see where the science leads us kind of thing, when he's asking, trying to put her, put her in his house or garage. That's not a very good fit, in my view, with the state's counsel's argument here. When they submit evidence, they are not looking for a specific answer. Oh, really? The memo belies that. The phone memo does. And Sherry Colhane, I understand herself, tells you that by the time these book all swabs are taken in November 2005, 
from all kinds of people other than Stephen Avery. Members of his family, these are elimination samples. Elimination samples. We have already decided they didn't do it. We're just trying to eliminate if we find their DA, their DNA anywhere. Sherry Colhain, for that matter, had she followed the protocol on her testing, the bottom line folks, had she followed her protocol on the testing of that bullet found in March. She can't say it's Teresa Holbeck's DNA. First time in her career, 23 years. First time on the last chance to put Teresa Holbeck in his house or garage, she deviates from the protocol and includes Teresa Holbeck. Now, it was just the control that was contaminated. It was just Sherry Colhane's DNA. That doesn't turn the evidentiary sample into having Teresa Holbeck's DNA. Okay, all right, fine. But the protocol presumably is there for a reason. Protocols are the foundation of good science. And the protocol says, if you have got contamination, you set that experiment aside and you do it again. You don't rely on that one. Science ought to be reliable. It ought to be consistent and it ought to be cautious. Otherwise, it's not science and the results simply aren't reliable. That's why you have a control. And when you get contamination, you now know that something has gone wrong with this. And to say that the contamination is over here, but not over here, it's a little like saying, I don't know, maybe no one, maybe no one even eats TV dinners anymore. Maybe they're microwave dinners now, I guess, from what I see in the grocery store. But whatever, whatever, you heat this stuff up. When you pull off the plastic or the tin or whatever covers the meal, you know, and the little peach cobbler has a fly in it in that little compartment. You don't eat the saucepan steak either. Okay. You know, this is, this is not fancy stuff in the end. It's, it is and should be common sense at some level in the end. But she deviates for the first time in 23 years. The end, this continues, the end of January 2007, bringing us up to six weeks ago. Now, the state goes all the way to Virginia, to Quantico, to get the FBI. Are they trying, is the FBI trying to root out possible police corruption? Are they concerned about the integrity of policing in northeastern Wisconsin? Trying to find out if there's a bad cop or not. I think the, the decision is already made. You have this too, Special Agent Gerald Mullen of the FBI. Memo to the FBI laboratory this January 30th. Judge, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I believe the defense is entitled to one closing. Mr. Buting covered exactly the same territory yesterday. I understood, I understood they were going to split and talk about different items. I simply want to interpose an objection. My apologies to counsel, but that was my understanding from the court. I would be more concerned about boring you. Mr. Buting did cover it. It's there. But I wanted to say something about EDTA that Mr. Buting did not. Janine Arvizu, who is not a doctor, Mr. Buting misspoke. She didn't complete her dissertation. She did the other PhD work. I wanted to make sure you got out of that what she had to tell you. And it's this. The FBI protocol that they put together in a couple of weeks here is good for identifying and confirming the presence of EDTA. It is not designed for confirming the absence of EDTA. It has to do with the detection limits. The instrument has a detection limit and the method has a detection limit. So look, if you were interested in finding out whether your friend is at home and the instrument you chose was a telephone, call him at his house, ring his telephone number. If he answers the phone, you have confirmed his presence 
with your instruments. He is there. You have called his home, not his cell phone. He is there. He's got to be if he's answering his phone. You have confirmed his presence. However, if your instrument is your telephone and you call his home and it just rings and rings and it's not answered, you have not confirmed his absence. He could be in the shower. He could be in the basement folding the laundry. He could be in bed sleeping. He could be pouting and just not answering the phone because he sees it's you calling on the caller ID and he doesn't want to talk to you today. Whatever it is, you haven't confirmed his absence with the telephone. You haven't designed a protocol to get you to that. Your method, in other words, of detection isn't suited to confirming absence, only presence. If you like fresh baked hot apple pie and I put you in a room and I blindfolded you and we walk in a fresh baked hot apple pie, your nose is the instrument. It has a detection limit. A dog has a better instrument. Lower detection limit, fancier instrument. He can detect less of the smell of apple pie than you can, but you have got this instrument to use. If it's within your detection limits and the pie is, you know, slid on the table under you while you are blindfolded, you will detect it with your instruments. However, if the method is no good, because we have got to consider that, you are not smelling an apple pie. Well, is the room too big? Are the windows open? Is the pie too far away? Does the room smell badly of something else that's interfering with your instruments detecting the fresh baked apple pie? We have method detection problems and limits. Or is the apple pie not fresh baked, but it's an 11 year old apple pie? You may not detect that either with your instruments. I don't think Janine Arvizu was really telling you more than that. And unfortunately, Le Boo Boo was trying to tell you more than that and overselling his case. Now, others who matter in the law enforcement group who think Stephen Avery is guilty, Mr. Link and Mr. Colburn, they denied here, of course, but what are they doing in 2002? When the evidence slip has to be signed for transmission of the hair sample and fingernail clippings, or whatever it is to the crime lab and the evidence custodian at the time, Detective Sergeant James Link signs off. Is he really, as he claims here, simply signing the form, giving it to Sergeant Shallow and allowing Sergeant Shallow to fill out the otherwise blank form? You are entitled to disbelieve that, or at least to say he's not an honest evidence custodian if he is doing that at the time. He is begging to be fired because he is not documenting what's going where. Or if he's just telling you here to distance himself from that file in the clerk's office, you are entitled to consider that too. Would Lieutenant Link lie in the end? Would he lie as a sworn law enforcement officer? Well, all I can tell you is he did. Twice, and you heard it. I have the transcript from the earlier hearing. Here he says he arrived at two o'clock. When he's asked under oath before, it's 6.30 or 7. Once when he's asked, and the other time he's asked, it's late afternoon. This isn't 15 minutes off, folks. It's under oath, and it's a difference of four and a half or five hours. At that time of year, November 2005, it's the difference between broad daylight and pitch black. He was under oath, and he gave two very different answers to the same question at two different times under oath. He was the only witness in five weeks shown to have made inconsistent statements under oath. Others made inconsistent statements and were shown to have. Blaine Dassey comes to mind. Scott Taddick comes to mind. Both of them are asked at first by the police, was there a bonfire on Halloween? No, no bonfire. Later, they get asked again. Now there is a bonfire. In fact, Scott Taddick comes here and says, big bonfire, flames to the top of the roof. 
Same guy, again, I showed when first asked by the police. No bonfire. Closer in time to October 31, no, didn't see a bonfire that night. That's inconsistent statements, but they are not under oath. They still, as the judge instructed you yesterday, are something you can consider consistency or inconsistency of a witness statement over time. Still, you can consider those when you decide who you believe and not under oath. Blaine explained that a little bit, explained his changes of his story. Well, the police kept asking him. They didn't like the answer. They asked him again, got angry with him and his mother at the restaurant when they wouldn't reject Uncle Steve. Is that because Blaine is scared of Uncle Steve? My recollection, yours will govern. There's 12 of you and one of me, but my recollection of that testimony is that the question was whether Blaine Dassey was scared and the answer was something like, no, not really, but he used to boss us around. You will decide that. But in any event, Lieutenant Link, by the time he gets to you folks, is telling you some really implausible things. Like, I have never been to Stephen Avery's house. I have never been on the Avery property. But somehow, just out of habit, I turned right at the end of Avery Road and I, I, I just happened to drive straight to Stephen Avery's trailer. Okay. So this, you know, what they are doing and whether, whether you think you can trust them back when they are not aware they are going to be observed or revealed later, it's important in the same way what he does. Back before he knows it's going to be played out to you, it's important in assessing who you believe. Are they acting honestly? Is he acting like an innocent person would act or might act? It is important because it comes down to the bias in the end. You know, would, in the end, police officers plant evidence? And that's a hard one, you know. That's why it's helpful to say, boy, are they behaving honestly and in good faith up to them? Because in the end, would they plant evidence against someone? Now, you will have to decide whether you have a reasonable doubt about that or whether, you know, we have shown that to you at any level or not. But look, it is a matter of bias if it's happened. And what you critically, I think, need to understand that if and when police officers plant evidence, they are not doing it to frame an innocent man. They are doing it because they believe the man guilty. They are not doing it to frame an innocent man. They are doing it to ensure the conviction of someone they have decided is guilty. That's why you plant evidence. Other than in the strangest, you know, most abandoned of conscience sort of police officer, they aren't after framing an innocent person. They are after ensuring the conviction of someone they just believe is guilty. So as you approach the whole concept of planting, you have got to understand the bias that would drive it. Not, you know, boy, they are out to get an innocent guy. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. But it's also just as corrosive to do it. Because juries decide guilt, not police officers who are involved in the hunt. You know, they get invested too in the outcome and in whom they suspect who they think is good for something. And, you know, the state poo-poos the idea that a civil lawsuit for a whole lot of money against the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department would have caused anyone to so dislike Stephen Avery that they would plant evidence against him. Well, look what the mere suggestion that they did plant evidence has done in terms of a reaction here. The defendant, the defensiveness of the case that the state presented to you, the anger about the mere suggestion of planting evidence, the self-righteousness, the hostility, the trying to have it both ways with you. We trusted the Manitowoc people. They were skilled. They were honest. They were the best available evidence technicians. But we also had somebody watching. We were short of manpower. We needed them. But in the first search of Stephen Avery's, first lengthy search of Stephen Avery's house, on that evening of November 5, 
we got enough people that two of them can be taking photos. Two of them can be taking photos in this little trailer, as you heard. You hear the states trying to have it both ways here. And in sort of getting at the bias that would drive a police officer, potentially, to plant evidence, it's this. It's this need, this belief that he is not really innocent. He's guilty. He's got to be guilty. It's what you hear from Detective Jacobs and Detective Remica. It's that quality. It's that sense that this is where this is going. Three hours in, when all we have got is the car on a big property with a whole lot of other people there. It's the, after five weeks of evidence and 501 exhibits, it's the state standing up and telling you it's clear. What in the world is clear and simple when it takes five weeks and 501 exhibits to try to show? Or whether this is whatever, whichever way you come out, this case isn't clear and simple. And that's where the civil lawsuit feeds in. It's not that it feeds in with bad cops. It feeds in with good cops in the sense that it erodes fundamentally the sense of identity. We get the bad guys. We don't get the good guys. And here it is. They got it wrong. That department got it wrong. Not only do they get it wrong, but the right guy is still out there and he commits another rape, Gregory Allen. This goes to my identity if I wear that same uniform. Even if I'm aligned with these people, as you hear the sort of reaction from the prosecutors to this. And now, you know, since... Since he really couldn't have been that innocent, he's got to be guilty of this one. He must be the right guy this time. So you, you know, nobody means to do this, but you start looking around things that are inconvenient, that don't quite square up with the theory that he did it. One example, and one example only, from the blood, Teresa Holbeck's blood in her own car. If it were true, as the state now says, that Stephen Avery shot Teresa Holbeck in his own garage, killed her there, and if it were true that he then burned her in the area immediately behind the garage, why, why is her bloody head ever in the Toyota at all? It's farther to take her back to her car than it is to take her around the corner of your garage to the burn site, if that's what it is. So the state sort of ignores the fact that if Steve Avery had done it and done it in the way they say, her blood wouldn't be in the car. The bloody hair stain wouldn't be there. It is there, of course, so it suggests that somebody did have to use the car as a transport. She wasn't burned there or wasn't killed there, but that's inconvenience. You guys have to be, in the end, if you're going to do what you can do here, more objective than that. You can't overlook the inconvenience because it doesn't fit. You can't overlook, for example, in deciding whether Lieutenant Link dropped the key on the floor rather than finding it honestly. You can't overlook the fact that all her other keys are gone. The three or four other keys that Tom Pierce described and which common sense would tell you would be on your key ring, and they are not there. It's the kind of thing that's inconvenient, but you can't overlook it, even if they do. The overlooking of the inconvenience, really, I think, reaches its peak, if you will, here in the state's opening statement, where knowing that human bone fragments are found, at least in the burn barrel, a long way from the burn area behind Stephen's garage, and maybe in the quarry to the south. Knowing, in other words, that their own experts will say, yeah, bones were moved here. The state never tells you in its opening statement there's a second place, and maybe even a third, where human bone fragments, burnt human bone fragments, are found. And we have no evidence that it's more than one person. You don't get told that. It's inconvenience. But it also is true. And that's why, in the end, it does become so important to decide, burned here and a few moved elsewhere, 
or burned somewhere else and most of them dumped here, behind Stephen Avery's garage. That's why that says so much about his guilt or innocence in the end. Look, I have got to sit down, which no defence lawyer ever likes to do because in the closing arguments, because the prosecution gets to stand back up. In a sense, they get the last word in closing arguments. I'm not going to get to answer the passion or the anger or the replies that will come when I sit down. I got to turn him over to you and let them have the last word. And as hard as that is on me, the greater burden is on you. The greater burden is on you because you have got to try to do the things you can do here and you have got to find a way to live with the things you can't do but would like to do here. You have got the great burden of reaching a just, fair and conscientious decision. And so, in a sense, I'm in a sense I'm going to rely on Judge Willis to give my rebuttal to their rebuttal, in a sense, because I think he will tell you, when all is said and done, that you won't be swayed by sympathy, prejudice or passion. And I think that will be an answer to what's about to come. I think he will, Judge Willis will, I think, in the end tell you, charge you, to be very careful and deliberate, deliberate in weighing the evidence and to keep your duty steadfastly. And that will be sufficient answer for me to what's about to come. So I ask you, please, give it your full and fair consideration. Do that critically here as citizens of Manitowoc County, where we stay to pick a jury, where we stay to pick the 12 of you, the 13 of you, and get it right. Get it right. Stephen Avery has not been proved guilty of murdering or mutilating the corpse of Teresa Holbeck. He's not been proved guilty of that beyond a reasonable doubt. It's because he is not guilty. And that's what I'm asking you to say in getting it right. Members of the jury, there is, as counsel indicated, there's one more argument. The state gets a chance for rebuttal. I'm going to take a 10 minute break at this time, then we'll come back to hear the state's argument and I will give you final instructions. You may be seated. And Mr Kratz, you may begin. Thank you, Judge. This part of the case is the shortest part, that is, the shortest argument, thankfully. But it's also the most difficult because I have to limit my comments to what the defense has argued. And it's also the part that it's a little bit out of my comfort zone. As you may have noticed throughout this trial, I've tried to be courteous. I have tried to examine witnesses with the fairness and the dignity and the respect for which they deserve in the courtroom. I have tried never to cut up a juror. When a juror wanted to explain an answer, I tried never to say, stop, I don't want to hear it, or the jury doesn't want to hear what the answer might be. And so this argument is different than that. It's necessarily not a civil. It's necessarily not my style. So I want to say that up front. Highly charged statements have been given by the defense in their closing arguments, and it's my responsibility to meet those, hopefully, with compelling argument. The things that you will find important when dismissing or discarding some of what the defense has tried to have you believe here. I may personally like Mr. Strain, and I may personally like Mr. Beauty. But their arguments, I most certainly do not like. I think they are unfair. I think they are unfair to you. I think in many instances, they have been what's called disingenuous, which means that I don't think that they have been totally truthful. And in all candor towards you, I think they have tried to fool you on a number of occasions. I've got a job to do. I have got a job to do as the lead prosecutor in this case. 
to make sure that you are not fooled, to make sure that you aren't sold something that isn't true. And that's what this argument is all about. The first argument that Mr. Strang made in the beginning of his opening statement, he made it again in the beginning of his closing statement. And at the end of his closing statement, referenced the 1985 wrongful conviction of that man, Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery was wrongfully convicted in 1985. We all understand that. We all believe that. But don't one of you consider anything about that case when deciding the facts of Teresa Halbach. Teresa Halbach, the Halbach family and the interests of justice deserve that you decided on this case, not on whether or not Mr. Avery deserves some sympathy or whether or not Mr. Avery deserves to set it right. That's something for civil lawsuits. That's something for other jurisdictions to deal with, to handle. It is absolutely improper for Mr. Strang to ask you to, in any way, consider that 1985 lawsuit when finally coming to a decision in this case. And in Mr. Strang's statement, in his opening statement, to send him home. Sending Mr. Avery home, if that is gonna happen, is going to be because the state the prosecution team, all of the agencies that you heard about didn't meet its burden. We didn't meet our burden of proof on this case, not because Mr. Avery was convicted in 1985. Let me also suggest to you that in a case this big, especially what we have called the largest criminal investigation. I don't know if it is the largest in state history, but it is certainly the largest that anybody that you have heard of has ever talked about. In a case that big, with that many witnesses, and you have just gotten a sliver of the number of witnesses and a sliver of the number of exhibits that are available in this case, Five or six weeks may seem like a long trial. Let me assure you, it could have been a lot, lot longer if we would have done the kinds of things that Mr. Strang asked us to do. As an example, if we would have followed every what's called blind alley, if we would have put in what's called negative evidence, that is, eliminate everybody who's not even a suspect in this case, which is what law enforcement did. That's their job. That's law enforcement's job. And then once we get to the prosecution stage, it is our job to present evidence on who we believe committed the crime. Does everybody understand that? So if we put in the entire case, if you will, that would certainly be something more than what would be relevant for State of Wisconsin versus Stephen Avery. That's what this case is about, not the 85 case. The very first issue that I want to talk about is perhaps the most problematic for the jurors. I want to address this up front because I believe that there were misrepresentations made in the defense closing. I believe they tried to fool you in their closing when they indicate that Mr. Link comes in and all of a sudden there's a key there. Well, that's part of the story and that of course is a true statement. But what the defense neglected in their closing to tell you was everything that Sergeant Colburn told you about this particular investigation. I put these two photos up 
because I'm calling them the before and the after shot. And I put them next to each other for a very, very important reason, because they say a picture states a thousand words. This should do that for you, the before and the after picture. These are taken just a couple of minutes apart from each other, but importantly, they are taken before the search, before what Mr. Colburn talked about, not so gently, or never so gently manipulating the cabinet, and then after that had already been accomplished. A couple of important things to note. First of all, we talked, I think in my closing or in my opening perhaps even, about the slippers, about how you, through your common sense, can reconcile those slippers, that piece of evidence, not just where they are situated with the wall socket there, but you can understand how both this cabinet was pushed to the left, pushing the left slipper over to the left, and pushing the right slipper over, and actually flipping the left slipper over, all right? And then after jostling, and after pushing, and after removing all the books, and after Sergeant Colburn talked about putting those books back in, and I want to get a correct verbiage, handle them none too gently. A key comes out the back end of this particular cabinet. Now, what hasn't been pointed out to you yet, many of you being observant may have already noticed the before and the after. This is the book that they were talking about. That particular binder that was slammed back into the cabinet. The before picture has the binder virtually adjacent or next to the cabinet itself. The after picture has it several inches back in. Why is that important? Why does that one fact corroborate or lend credence to Sergeant Colburn? Sergeant Colburn said he slammed that book back, none too gently. You have to kind of envision this cabinet cocked and the back of the cabinet opened, the book slamming back and the key falling through that particular cabinet. And so the testimony in connection with all of the physical evidence and not just what Mr. Strang or Buting might tell you some of the evidence is, where Lieutenant Link comes in and says, oh, there's a key, which did happen, but the explanation is absolutely plausible. But more than that, we're going to need to delve into this key and into this planting issue, whether or not the key was planted. Was the key planted? All right, to get to that supposition, or to get to that conclusion, which really is a supposition, because you're going to have to guess. You have to know some things about Sergeant Link, excuse me, Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn. You have to know if they are good, honest, decent cops, or if they are not. Now, we asked some questions and you can weigh their credibility and they both appeared indignant about this. They both appeared upset about even being accused of such a thing. And that demeanor, that credibility, is something that you can and you should take into consideration. In fact, when each of them said, absolutely not, absolutely not, would I ever plant evidence in this case. But as importantly than that is the lack of evidence. Mr. Strang was allowed quite properly to talk about the lack of evidence that the state would have presented. Wouldn't you have expected evidence? Is I think the way Mr. Strang had placed it? Well, that works both ways. And subpoena power and power to bring in physical evidence applies equally to the state as it does to the defense. 
We know that because the defense has subpoenaed some witnesses. They have brought some witnesses in here. They have subpoenaed some documents. And you have seen those subpoenaed documents in this case. Well, don't you think, folks, that if either Sergeant Colburn or Lieutenant Link had a pimple, had a blemish on their record for truthfulness or for honesty or for planting evidence or for doing anything that was opposed to the oath that they took to uphold the law in Manitowoc County, don't you think you would have heard about that? Don't you think that those two good lawyers, excellent in fact, defense attorneys, would have presented that to you? So when Mr. Strang tells you to look at the big picture and when he talks about, let's see how they acted beforehand. Beforehand, you didn't hear any evidence at all about Mr. Link or Mr. Colburn. That is significant. But as significant is the facts and circumstances surrounding this particular bedroom. And when Mr. Kaharski, Deputy Kaharski, talked about sitting on this bed and actually facing towards the door, his feet, I think the testimony was, were facing where the key ends up when Lieutenant Link exits the room and comes back. Don't you have to kind of ask yourself the question, how did the key get there? If it was planted, how did that key get there? Did Lieutenant Link, as he was walking here, throw it? Did he kind of lob it over Mr. Kaharski? Well, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And although all three of these officers and in fact, the prosecution team would have preferred, obviously, that the key wouldn't have been found in this way. It was, all right. Cases come to you how they are. And again, under the microscope of a case of this magnitude, there's going to be some human factors. And there's going to be some things that you're going to have to wrestle with. And this is one of those things. I'm not going to shortchange you on that particular case. And you may take a long time in deciding whether or not that key is significant or whether the key is not significant. But let me ask you, just kind of for the sake of talking, as Mr. Strang wanted to talk with you rather than at you, I certainly have a style that I would prefer that as well. Let's assume that they never found the key. Let's assume this key isn't part of this case at all. Let's assume Mr. Strang's theory is correct, that these cops aren't trying to plant an innocent person, but trying to make sure that a guilty person is found guilty. Well, can't you then, with that argument, set the key aside? Do you have the ability as a jury to set that key aside if in fact it doesn't matter whether or not Mr. Avery is guilty or not guilty in this analysis? Can you set that aside and decide is there enough other evidence or is the key the only thing that points to Mr. Avery? Well, if this was a CSI case or of those cases on TV where sometimes that key or sometimes one little piece of evidence like that may decide the guilt or innocence, it would make a difference. But that key in the big picture, in the big scheme of things here, means very little. All right. Now, I'm telling you that not because I don't want you to consider it, not because I think that it's not important or not because the credibility of these officers is in question to the state at all. What I am suggesting, though, is that if you buy Mr. Strang's argument, if you buy Mr. Strang's argument that they were trying to make sure that a guilty person was found guilty, 
then assigning accountability to the murder for Teresa Hapa shouldn't matter whether or not that key was planted. In other words, it shouldn't matter to the Hapa family. You shouldn't be punishing the police officers. In other words, the other officers that were involved in this investigation. If you come to that conclusion, you're not going to. You're not going to come to that conclusion because you've heard nothing about these police officers that they would do such a thing. But my suggestion is simply not to focus all your attention. In the law, that's called searching for doubt. The judge has told you and may even tell you again in your closing instruction that you are to search for the truth. You are not to search for doubt. In other words, you don't go into this case saying, well, let's look at where all the discrepancies are first. That's the place maybe that we should start because as my closing argument suggested to you, there's got to be a reason, right? There's got to be a reason that we have been here for five weeks. No, there doesn't. There doesn't have to be a reason why you've been here for five weeks other than the defendant's constitutional right to a trial. And so the judge will tell you not to start there. The judge will tell you not to search, not to start at searching for doubt. The judge will tell you that the whole process, the beginning of the process, the middle, and the end, is to search for the truth. To search for the truth in this case is who killed Teresa Hapa. Not whether or not we can find some discrepancies. More about the key. Mr. Buting, I believe it was, had the imagination, let's just call it, to suggest to you that maybe officers were taking a toothbrush and were kind of rubbing Mr. Avery's toothbrush on the key. And that's how the DNA got on the key. Common sense should tell you that these kind of motions, what are called furtive motions, or for lay people, for people like you, it's called suspicious looking things. It's something that you should probably discard because if they take Mr. Avery's toothbrush and start rubbing it on the key, you know, and then kind of hold it behind their back, that becomes almost cartoonish. That becomes something that is not at all plausible, but as important, when did that happen? When did they plant the DNA on Mr. Avery's key? Because we're not just talking about planting a key. If it was planting a key, that's damning enough. It's damning enough to have this particular key in Mr. Avery's bedroom. But wait, what makes it irrefutable? is that Mr. Avery's DNA, positive, 100% match, is on that key, right? And you heard testimony from Ms. Culhane and perhaps others that the last person to handle a key or an object is most likely to leave the DNA on the key. Now, Mr. Strang and Mr. Buting have asked you to just discard that, ignore it. Ignore that expert opinion. I don't know why they're asking you to do that because it doesn't fit with their theory of the defense. But it's the DNA on the key that has to be planted too. Please understand that. It's not just planting the key. It's planting the DNA, the DNA on the key as well. If they planted the key, where did they get the key? Now, that leads to an interesting series of questions as well. There are only two ways that law enforcement can get this key, all right? Because the vehicle was locked. And because on the 5th of November, officers don't really have access, as you have seen by the scene security. They 
had to have access to the key before the fifth. And so there's only two ways to do that. One, they kind of stumble across it in a scenario that Mr. Strang suggests, maybe off duty or something like that. Or the last person to hold that key, other than Teresa Haba, is the person who killed her. Now, you heard that testimony in this case. It may have drawn an objection. I don't remember right now. Use your own collective knowledge as to whether it did. But that makes sense that the last person, other than Teresa, to hold this key is the person who killed her. And if that's the case, then you hold these two gentlemen responsible for suggesting that to you. In other words, despite Mr. Buting standing up here, I think it was the beginning of yesterday, saying, look, folks, we're not saying that the cops killed Teresa Halba. What we're saying is that somebody else, I think his words were, skillfully exploited law enforcement bias. As if there's somebody smart enough out there that could do that. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But when you go down one layer, when you scrape one layer of this manure off of the topsoil, that is what it is. You scrape one layer, you will realize that the cops had to kill her. The cops had to be involved in killing Teresa Haba. Now, are you prepared to say that? Are you? As the jury, in order to find Mr. Avery not guilty, willing to say that your cop, that your Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputies, Lieutenant Link, Sergeant Colburn, because of Mr. Avery's lawsuit, that Sergeant Colburn and Lieutenant Link didn't have a dime of stake in, at least financially, that they weren't involved in, in 1985, that they gave a death position in about receiving a phone call and transferring the phone call, and that's the extent to it. But because of that involvement, are you willing to say that these two otherwise honest cops came across a 25-year-old photographer, killed her, mutilated her, burned her bones, all to set up and to frame Mr. Avery. You have got to be willing to say that. You have got to make that leap. Because of this question right there, where did they get the key? The key isn't alone. The key is attached. At least at some point to something called a lanyard. Something that's around the neck, similar to what you're all wearing as juror badges. We know that that comes from Katie Hoppe. We know that that is found inside Teresa's SUV. And so where one is, the other one is, all right? So I hope that makes sense. I, I hope you understand that. At least for the first time in my rebuttal, I'm going to be suggesting that you dig down that one further step and understand exactly what these two gentlemen are suggesting to you. Despite Mr. Buting trying to sell you on the fact that we're not saying the cops did it, that's exactly what they are saying. That's exactly what they are arguing to you. And you have to be prepared to go there. The next time that Mr. Buting tried to fool you was when he told you that the police never checked out other suspects in this case. Well, you heard from Mr. Wiegert. You heard from Mr. Fassbender. More particularly, that other suspects were checked out. But let's think about other suspects. Who were the other suspects in this case? Where was the evidence pointing so strongly other than to Mr. Avery? Where was it? Where was the evidence pointing? Well, one choice was Mr. Schmitz was one of the people that saw Ms. Hava. Mr. Schmitz, as you heard, was interviewed, was checked out. But guess what, folks? Teresa Hava left that photo shoot alive. That kind of eliminates Mr. Schmitz, doesn't it? 
from being a suspect in this case. Number two was Joellen Zipper. And although a nice little old lady like that probably could have killed and mutilated Teresa Hobbuck, guess what, folks? Teresa Hobbuck left Mrs. Zipper alive at about 2.27 p.m. The third suspect then, or the third logical person, was Mr. Avery. That's the third customer that Teresa sees that day. That's the only person that Teresa Hoppe doesn't leave alive, or at least isn't seen alive after meeting with Mr. Avery. So Schmitz and Zipperer can be and were early on, I'll admit that, were early on eliminated as suspects in the case. As the case develops though, you heard from Mr. Fassbender that all the clues started pointing toward one person, all right? So when we talk about roommates and we talk about old boyfriend, what you would think about as typical suspects that may in fact be investigated doesn't make a whole lot of sense in devoting a lot of resources in investigating those people. When the car is found in a different location, when blood is found in that car, that turns out to be that of Mr. Avery. But I guess most importantly, when the bones of the victim are found 20 feet or so behind the property belonging to Mr. Avery, you stop looking. You stop looking for people like boyfriends or other customers or this kind of search. And you narrow it to who had access to Teresa Hava at that particular time. So it's disingenuous. It's what I'm calling fooling you to suggest that other suspects in this case were not ever checked out. Mr. Strang talked about his phone call. This phone call. Mr. Strang talked about this phone call. Now, this is going to take a really really good memory and I hope one of you and the 12 of you collectively we call it collective memory which means that when you deliberate in this case you can talk about those kinds of those kinds of things when Mr. Strang first played this or attempted to play this particular tape for Mr. Colburn I wonder if anybody remembers the very next thing that happened I raised my hand and I said, objection, your honor. I said, I want some authentication. Before Mr. Strang can play this tape, I objected and said, I want to know the date and the time of the tape because it's unfair to play this tape for the jury without telling them the date and the time that it's played. All right. So it's foreseen this very argument that Mr. Strang made about a half hour ago or an hour ago, that this, that is, the tape could have been the third, but I think it was the fourth, okay? That's what Mr. Strang said to you, that Mr. Colburn, the, the answer by Mr. Colburn was, it was on the third, but I think it was on the fourth. What the heck do I care, Mr. Strang, what you think? What do I care if you think that it was the fourth or that if it fits your theory of defense? This case is about evidence. It's not about what Mr. Strang thinks. The answer given on the witness stand was, it was the third while on duty. And the explanation about why it was a phone call rather than a radio transmission or a dispatch kind of call is because Mr. Weekert had called Mr. Colburn if you remember, on the phone, all right? He called him on the phone and said, can you check this out? So in turn, Mr. Colburn called dispatch and said, I wanna verify this particular plate. Nothing sinister about that. Nothing unusual about that. This isn't a traffic stop. It's not a stop where you would radio it in where your time and your date become important and you want to log in that kind of thing. It's not a traffic stop at all. It's simply verifying 
Mr. Wickert's information. Verifying the year, the license plate, the make and model of the vehicle. Nothing sinister. Now, I'm going to ask you to reject what Mr. Strang said because that's not evidence. In fact, what I'm saying to you right now is not evidence. Evidence comes from the witness stand, all right? The answer to that question was the 3rd of November. That is important. It's important whether it was the 3rd or whether it was the 4th. Now, when Mr. Strang answered my objection by saying, well, well, let the witness tell the jury when it is. And the judge allowed that. And the witness did tell the jury when that was, that it was the 3rd. Mr. Strang still today, still today, fools you and stands before you and says, don't believe Mr. Colburn. I think it was the fourth. All right. That's the difference between evidence and speculation. That's the difference between the state's case and what the defense is trying to sell you in their arguments. Bones were moved in this case. There's no question of that. Who moved the bones? To the state? Or for the theory of the prosecution is easy. Mr. Avery moved the bones. He moved the big bones. He moved the big bones. The ones he could identify as human bones. From his burn pit. Over to his sister's burn barrel. All right? That's a couple hundred feet away. If you think about the selfishness involved in that particular act, that I think is, is one factor, but I guess more importantly, is directing your attention away from himself. Might that be, might that first night, might be the 31st, might be the first or the second, because he has a couple of days, as it turns out, before the police officers actually start the investigation. But let's also remember this collectively. I want the 12 of you to remember this when you deliberate. I want at least one of you to say this when you are back in the jury room. Although now we know that the cops didn't get the search warrant and they didn't come on the property until the 5th of November, okay? We know that. Stephen Avery didn't know that. Stephen Avery didn't know that Teresa Hobart wasn't going to be reported missing until the 3rd, or that the flyover search wasn't going to find the car, or that Ms. Stern even was going to find the car on the 5th. For all Stephen Avery knows, the cops are on their way, right away, on their way, right away, the afternoon, the late afternoon, or early evening of the 31st. Why is that important? Because as it goes through some of this evidence and your collected memories, and as you deliberate this case, please remember that. Because there are things that Mr. Avery does that the defense is saying, well, why would he do all of those kinds of things? Mr. Avery did all of those things on the 31st because he didn't know that the cops weren't going to be knocking on his door that very night. They didn't know that. Mr. Avery didn't know that Teresa wasn't meeting a friend for dinner or that she wasn't going to be missed or that she didn't have another appointment after she was killed by Mr. Avery. And so that's why he starts burning things right away. That's why at 345, the electronics are already being burned. That's why, as we will be arguing and showing you, Mr. Avery disposes of the body at the earliest possible moment, that he moves the SUV at the earliest possible moment, that he removes the license plate. He does all those things again with the benefit as you saw in the photograph that Mr. Remaker put in of a police scanner that's inside and on top of the bar in Mr. Avery's. The police scanner so that Mr. Avery can hear are the cops on their way, which again should bolster 
or should tell you why Sergeant Colburn uses the telephone rather than using the radio. It's because of things just like that, things like officer safety. But again, I'm advancing a little bit and I wanna make sure that I get to those points. The bones were moved, but they were moved by Mr. Avery. These bones in the quarry, I'm gonna take about 20 seconds to talk about that because the best anybody can say is that they are possible human. What does possible human mean? Well, it means we don't know what it is, all right? The best anthropologists in the world don't know what these bones are. Dr. Eisenberg didn't know what they were. Dr. Fairgreed didn't know what they were. He agreed with that. And you heard a stipulation being read to you by a person by the name, name of Les McCurdy. Stipulation just means an agreement between the parties that these bones, we felt it important enough, were sent out to the FBI. And Les McCurdy from the FBI determined that these bones were so degraded that they were in such a shape that even through testing, what's called mitochondrial DNA testing, whether they are human or not, could not, even by the FBI, be determined. So the bones in the quarry are really not evidence in this case. And so Mr. Strang has made a big deal out of showing you maps and a little flag and things like that about a possible bones. Again, speculation, conjecture is not part of this case. Facts are going to be what decides this case. Your Honor, I'm going to interpose an objection. Like the 1985 case, there is evidence here concerning the bones from the quarry, possible human bones. It is proper for any lawyer to argue all of the evidence or any of the evidence in the case, including the 1985 case or the quarry bones, and I would like the jury so instructed. What I will instruct the jury says, remind you again, what you are hearing at this time are arguments, not evidence. Your job, when you are deliberating, is to remember the evidence as it's been submitted and draw your own conclusions from that evidence. Mr. Kratz, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. The primary burn site, that is, where the bones started burning, are important in a sense, and they are not important in a sense. All right. It seems obvious what the answer is, but if, again, you drag that first layer off the defense argument, it isn't going to make any difference. But, of course, the primary burn location is in Mr. Avery's pit. This is the primary burn location. And why do we say that? Dr. Fairgreave, I'm going to start from the other side. Dr. Fairgreave, the defense expert in this case, said that he's had a case where bones were moved from one location to the other, and that in that case, the bones moved to, to the location had more bones than were actually there. But what Dr. Fairgreave didn't do what he doesn't know are all the things that Dr. Eisenberg did and all the things that Dr. Eisenberg knows. Dr. Eisenberg, of course, looked at the bone. I guess that's the most important factor. But this is one of those things that's common sense. This is one of those things that shouldn't take you long, shouldn't take you a long time collectively, shouldn't take the 12 of you very long to decide where the primary burn location is. It is the pit. It's not most likely the burn pit. It is this location. How do we know that? Well, Teresa was invited or lured, whatever term you want to use, onto that property. Her vehicle is there. That's the last place that she is seen alive. It's just several feet from this location. Her burn defects are on that particular property, just a few feet away. Importantly though, her bone, her tissue, especially her skull fragments, all of them, all of them are in this location. Her clothes are there, at least what's left of her clothes. 
are mixed in with those bones. The rivets for her jeans are there. In common sense, her bones and her jeans are in the same place because she's burned there. She's burned in that location. She was called there by Mr. Avery. And the number one, if we're doing, I'm gonna switch them around. The number one reason why this is the primary burn location is that on October 31st, Mr. Avery had a big whopping fire there. And on the 31st of October, and we haven't heard any evidence of a big whopping fire, the kind that would consume, fully consume a human body anywhere else on that property. That's the primary burn location, ladies and gentlemen. You can find that. You should find that beyond a reasonable doubt. That shouldn't be a question for you. Mr. Buting said that there was no fingerprints found on the SUV. I will just, again, in 20 seconds, tell you that the testimony that perhaps Mr. Buting is ignoring from Mr. Riddle, or at least didn't tell you about from Mr. Riddle, the fingerprint guy, was that, was that of the eight latent prints that were lifted in the case, none of them were suitable for identification. All right. So what Mr. Riddle also told you is that if you took your right hand now and placed it onto an object, it's very likely that you wouldn't leave fingerprints. That's why DNA evidence is so much more powerful than fingerprint evidence, at least nowadays, because of those dynamics that are involved. Because of the amount of sweat in your hand and the oils and all of those kinds of things, all are called into question. I just mentioned that because I love the word sweat. Um, I just mentioned that because I am obligated to because Mr. Buting had mentioned that. They also, they meaning the defense, talked about Teresa's body in the SUV. Once again, Expert testimony was that five foot six inch person could in fact fit in this particular compartment of the RAV4. And I guess you need to look no further than this area, the stamp, as I talked about, the hair impression 25 year old Teresa has left in that location. You can almost see Teresa being pushed in or shoved in or stuck in that location, which brings me, or will bring me, to a point in just a moment. Mr. Strang, excuse me, Mr. Puting actually asked you whether or not it would be reasonable for police, by use of flashlights, to see the stain that was by the ignition. When I heard that, I just about dropped my pen. All right, there's the location, and that's the stain that Mr. Buting is saying. Why didn't the cops see this? Somebody want to tell me where a flashlight has to be shined, shown from the outside to see that stain? You can see that through the front window. You can see that through one of the side windows. Are you going to see that through the very back? Where are you going to shine that flashlight that you're going to be able to see that particular stain, all right? That's disingenuous. It's the kind of argument that you should be discarding, that you should be saying it doesn't make any sense at all. Mr. Buting also asked, well, if this piece of evidence is, excuse me, if the cabinet, the bookcase is so important, why didn't the state bring it into the courtroom? I mentioned before, I think it's obvious, the state doesn't have exclusive control over the over any evidence in this particular case, at least as is presented in court. The defense has just as much right to bring that up here as the state did, all right? We have taken photos and I'm going to apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize for what Mr. Buting called my slick PowerPoint. My God. A second grade teacher can do a PowerPoint examination. 
And the fact that Mr. Butting wants to fumble around, he can do that. I'm not going to do that to the jury. But what he did do is we took photographs of all the evidence to make it easier to present so that you could see all the evidence. We brought in boxes of items like the Palm Zire Palm Pilot box. We have the item itself, but we also have a picture of it. We have a picture of everything, as you've seen. And so we're using pictures instead of the thing itself. And you can see and at least understand with big clumsy kinds of items, the reason that we're doing that for ease for the jury so that you can see big things and you can see small things so we can zoom into areas. And sometimes we don't need to do that. Defense also suggested that there was no blood on the CD case. Are you kidding me? Mr. Buting may have showed you a picture and I didn't know where he got this picture from, but the blood is obvious on the CD case. By the way, I believe you're going to be getting the photographs back into the jury room. That's something the judge will decide, not me. But you can look at the picture itself and determine whether or not there's blood on the CD case. Again, another example of being disingenuous. Another example of trying to fool you. Next time this happened in Mr. Buting's argument yesterday was when he talked about this stain on the bathroom floor. Mr. Buting actually walked up to this particular exhibit and said, well, it looks like somebody took a Q-tip and put it right into that sample of blood which you heard some of the blood from Mr. Avery's bathroom was analyzed. That it was in fact Mr. Avery's blood. There isn't any question about that. But what Mr. Buting didn't tell you and what you heard testimony of is when this blood sample was collected. Do you remember? Do you remember when this blood sample was collected? Remember Detective Remaker and Mr. Tyson on the first night talking about about going through the entire trailer and collecting all the blood and that they finished sometime after 10 p.m. As it was approaching 11 p.m., it was pouring rain outside. You all remember that? You remember that from the 5th of November. Mr. Buting is trying to sell you. He's trying to fool you into thinking that maybe this is the source of the blood in the SUV. Folks, the SUV was already in an enclosed and locked trailer. On its way to Madison, the crime lab personnel and law enforcement personnel all surrounding it. To suggest to you that this might be the source of any of all of that blood that you saw in the SUV is, again, disingenuous. It's trying to fool you. And it's my job as the prosecutor to point those things out to you. It's my job to show you just how absurd and ridiculous some of those arguments are. Mr. Buting then talked about the bullet and about the DNA and suggested that, well, they're both in the same room with Sherry Colhane, Miss Colhane, the analyst in this particular case. What Mr. Buting doesn't tell you though, doesn't remind you though, when Mr. Gan made this point very clear because of what's called the contamination issue with the bullet in this case, is that the extract for a sample of evidence is done separately and at a separate time than the extract or the control is done. Remember Ms. Colhane telling you that the samples are locked away in a cabinet. She was talking about her bench and how it's cleaned off and those kinds of things. And I don't know if Mr. Buting, I suspect he wants you to believe if you remember collectively, if you remember about Ms. Colhane, if he's suggesting that the pap smear or the DNA from Teresa Hobout somehow got out of the sealed envelope that it was in, the standard, somehow maybe walked across her desk, somehow it jumped into the vial or onto the bullet. And that's the kind of thing that Mr. Buting wants you to believe. 
That's disingenuous. It doesn't happen that way. Mr. Gong knew that was an important point and he took time, meticulous time with Ms. Colhane to explain that process for you. It's Teresa Hobbs DNA on that bullet because unfortunately it went through her body. Not because the DNA from her pap smear or from other standard that was within the crime lab somehow transmitted itself or made its way onto that bullet. There are areas of agreement and this is, I guess, a positive part of the trial. There are some areas of agreement between expert witness in this case. Ms. Arvizu, and I'm so happy that Mr. Strang cleared that up. It's not Dr. Arvizu. Mr. Strang called it a mistake that Mr. Beauty made calling her or raising her to the level of doctor. She doesn't have a PhD like Dr. LeBeau does. The PhD, the head of the toxicology unit at the FBI lab. But Ms. Arvizu, even the defense expert conceded on cross-examination from Mr. Gan a couple of things. Number one, that a qualitative procedure is a solid scientific procedure. Don't have to do quantitative. In fact, in this case, when there's nothing there, in other words, when three of the samples don't have any EDTA, you can't quantitate it. How do you quantitate nothing, all right? You can't do that. And so for the purposes, when these tests had to be done at the last minute, you heard why. You heard why we didn't get these to the FBI until the last minute. You heard from Mr. Weekert that Mr. Weekert in the state didn't even know about this vial of blood until sometime in December. And you heard that on February 5th, the 5th of February, when you were being selected, is when this was sent out to the FBI. Back to Ms. Arvisu, though, she recognized that the protocol that was developed was a good protocol, that it was based upon scientific articles that Dr. LeBeau had made what she called significant improvements to any prior protocols that the FBI had done based upon those articles and was no question at all that Dr. LeBeau was able to find several things. First of all, that there was EDTA in the vial of blood. Number two, that there was no detectable EDTA on the three blood samples. Now, what Ms. Arvisu did have some concern about is that this expert only tested three of the samples, all right? Three of the swabs that, that we're talking about. And I think, I don't think that's the next slide. It is not. I will show those in just a minute when we get to the EDTA part of this case. But there wasn't any question that EDTA was present in the vial and no ETTA was detectable on the sample. We also heard agreement between Dr. Fairgrieve and Dr. Eisenberg. The agreement that we have heard. In fact, we liked Dr. Fairgrieve very much from Canada. And although he's not board certified, you should not hold that against him. Dr. Eisenberg is an that is only a handful of anthropologists that reached that level. But we actually thought Dr. Freak Fairgrave was a very, very nice man and a very good expert. And he testifies mostly for, in Canada, for, for the prosecution. And I suspect that's why he conceded several things about his colleague, Dr. Eisenberg. First of all, that the gunshot wounds were present that there were gunshot wounds that were found in this case, two of them, one in the left parietal, one in the occipital region. He called them paramortem, meaning that they were about or around the time of death. He agreed that there, were only, there was only one person 
the bones of one person that we're talking about, which makes sense, and that the gunshot wounds were inflicted in this case before this burning process. All right. So Dr. Fairgreave and Dr. Eisenberg had many, and other than the primary burn site, which Dr. Eisenberg rendered an opinion about, and Dr. Fairgreave was unwilling to do that. Most other areas were, in fact, something that, that they had agreed upon. Judge, we should take just a couple minutes for a stretch break. Very well. We can do that. I know it's been about 45, 50 minutes. Let's do that, and then I will conclude my remarks. Let's take five minutes, at the request of one of the jurors. We'll do that, Judge. Mr. Kratz, you may continue. I appreciate it, Judge. Thank you. Defense argued that there was no blood found in the trailer. Since Teresa wasn't killed in the trailer, there shouldn't be. But what was found in the trailer is extremely important. Remember the testimony early on in this case that on the 5th, on the very first search of Mr. Avery's trailer, they found the very same Auto Trader magazine. The very same type of bill of sale that we put in the exhibit. That's from Mrs. Zipperer. The very same Auto Trader magazine. Very same bill of sale. Teresa was in that trailer. She was in the trailer, but she was not killed in that trailer. Defense has a hard decision to make regarding Ms. Colhane. Is she competent? Or is she incompetent? And you guys already know why that question has arisen and why it is such a pointed question. Because if she's talented enough with one hair, with one piece of evidence to exonerate Mr. Avery, why isn't she talented enough with 180 items of physical evidence to contribute to his conviction? So it's a hard argument to make that in one case and in one circumstance, a couple of years ago, she was very talented. She knew exactly what she was doing, but all of a sudden she's bumbling. Some mill worker, some person on a line type person who really doesn't have any expertise. Well, you don't get it both ways. She's either talented, she either knows what she's doing, as the head of the DNA unit at the Madison Crime Lab, or she's incompetent. You already know the state's opinion regarding Ms. Colhane. We've heard a lot about the crime lab contamination laws. 89 out of the 50,000 or so cases. I will let you guys do the math as far as what the rate of error or the contamination rate is. Mr. Buting mentioned yesterday that perhaps the hood latch, perhaps the DNA that is found here was caused by that of Mr. Stocky because Mr. Stocky reached up under the open, reached up under and opened up and found that the battery cable was disconnected. Well, so what? Mr. Stocky talked about he was rummaging around. He was actually touching all kinds of DNA and touching all kinds of blood or any of those kinds of things. Absolutely not. These are professionals. These are people that process evidence for a living. Mr. Stocky had gloves on when he opened, latex gloves when he opened this particular vehicle. So it is not Mr. Stocky's, it was Mr. Avery's DNA that is on the hood hat. Now, the defense also asked, why would Mr. Avery disconnect the battery? You heard them asking for speculation, guessing why Mr. Avery would disconnect the battery. I've got an answer, and I'm going to tell you right now, right now, that this is speculation. This is guessing, all right? This is an evidence. It's not even close to it. It's kind of what the defense has been doing through at least their closing arguments. But I'm going to speculate, and I'm going to guess that a man who hit the SUV and 
knew that people were going to come looking for that SUV, thought a little bit ahead, not just to crush the car and taking or in unhooking the battery, and, but when citizen searchers looked at 40 acres of cars and they looked and they go, oh, my goodness gracious, how am I going to find that? Mr. Avery may have thought about those little devices that most of us have on our newer cars, where we're able to press a button and our lights go on, or an alarm goes on, or something flashes, or you can find your car in a parking lot. If you're like me sometimes, and I forget where I have parked my car. Is that why Mr. Avery unhooked the battery? So that the citizen searchers that he knew were coming couldn't just press a button and of the 40,000 cars could right, walk right to that. That's possible, all right? That's an inference, a logical inference that could be drawn. But that's speculating and that's not what I'm gonna do. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you at all in this case to speculate. I'm simply answering Mr. Buting's question. Where was Teresa killed? This is an easy answer, or at least it's an answer that is directed by all of the physical evidence in this case. Teresa Halbach, as we know, came to the trailer of Stephen Avery. We know that they completed their transaction. How do we know that? Because the book and the bill of sale was given to Mr. Avery. That's something that, as you heard, happens at the end of the transaction. That's sitting on Mr. Avery's computer desk. We know sometime later, that is. We know sometime in the future, a bullet is found in this exact area. Has Teresa Hava's DNA on it, all right? The inference, and this is an inference that I'm asking you to draw, is that Teresa Hava was killed in the garage. She was killed in Stephen Avery's garage. Now, we've heard testimony about luminol finding blood. That is a reagent, a chemical that is used by the crime lab, is spread out. There's two things that are most reactive with luminol. One is human blood and the other is bleach. Bleach, coincidentally, is the one thing that eats up or destroys DNA. We have heard about just to the left and just to the back of this tractor, about a three to four foot area, large area that lit up or glowed very brightly. Mr. Erdl testified about that. He was the person who processed that area. I'm asking you to infer that Mr. Avery cleaned up this area with bleach. Now, you knew that inference or that suggestion from the state, I think, was coming. We have put in the bleach. We have talked about the luminol. We have gotten expert testimony from Mr. Erdl that the two things that light up, it wasn't blood, but it was in fact bleach. You heard from Blaine Dassey, importantly, that the garage, other than the junk on the surrounding edges of this garage, looked pretty much like this from the sense of the Suzuki and the snowmobile, which were in there later on that week, were on the side of the garage at the time. So Teresa Hoppe's vehicle is backed in, backed into the garage. Teresa Hoppe is killed. She's laying down. She's shot twice, once in the left side of her head, once in the back of her head. Or I guess I should more accurately say, she shot at least twice. Because two bullets were found, two entrance wounds were found to her head. We do have 11 shell casings on the six that were recovered. How many times Mr. Avery actually shot this poor girl? You probably aren't gonna be able to, to determine, but it's at least twice, and it's at least twice to the head. What does he do, though, later with Teresa Hoppe? 
It's the state's theory in this case, and we're entitled to a theory, just like the defense, that after backing in the SUV into the garage, which was again empty at the time, after closing the garage door, which Mr. Fabian testified is how he saw it at around dusk, Mr. Avery does a couple of things. Remember, he doesn't know if the cops or somebody is coming looking for Teresa. He has got lots to do. He has got lots of things in the next several hours to do in this case. He has to get rid of all of Teresa's stuff, her camera, her cell phone, her PDA, which very well may be in a purse or something in the vehicle, which he burned. He knows that those are in the burn barrel. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And he places Teresa Halbach in the back or the cargo area of her own SUV. Now, in doing that, Mr. Avery does a couple of things. He doesn't do it very gently because we know that there's motion involved. He throws, if you will, Teresa in the back because of the blood spatter across the back of the open gate. But Teresa is laying at rest. She is resting at peace, having been killed by Mr. Avery, kind of diagonally in the back of that SUV. And because of her hair imprint, you're able to deduce that. You're able to know that. Again, remember my closing argument. Those are more indications of Teresa telling you, this is where I was. All right, this is where he put me. And those are inferences, again, that you should and can adopt. Why? Because it's not dark yet. And he needs a big, rip-roaring fire before he can dispose of and mutilate this body. Again, he's got to do all of this stuff quickly because he doesn't know if the police are coming. So we hear then at, at, at least 7.30, perhaps before then, but at 7.30, there's already a fire, a big fire in the back. Although it's dark out, there's a big fire in the back of his garage. And we'll talk about some of the more details there. But as long as Mr. Buting asked about the theory of prosecution, again, which we are entitled, that is in fact the theory of the state's prosecution. Mr. Buting then asked, why would you build a fire when you have a smelter? The smelter, as we know, or at least this is from the top of the smelter, which kind of melts aluminum, as I understand it, is if you heard the testimony or if you saw the business buildings, the outbuildings much closer to the residences of the parents of Dolores and Allen, much closer to the residence of Charles Avery, the brother. Early on in this case, we identified what all those buildings were and what were in all of those separate buildings. But what Mr. Avery had to do required some time alone. Mr. Avery needed some privacy. And so Mr. Avery chose his burn area. He chose the place where somebody wouldn't happen upon him or ask him what he was doing. He was building a fire like he had done many times before. It's an area over which he had control. No other family members would be. And importantly, Mr. Pavito, the arson investigator, remember he went through the smelter, eliminates the smelter as a possible burn location for the body. Mr. Buting asked yesterday, did we confuse Lisa Buckner in this case? When she originally testified, Mr. Strang, I believe, questioned her. Mr. Strang provided the answer. Again, this takes a good memory. This takes a lot of you to remember. Lisa Buckner's question and answer. But the question was that, I'm paraphrasing, but directing your attention to the lift to the 31st of October, what did you see? Well, what does that, what that does when you ask a question like that, as a skilled lawyer, 
and Mr. Strength certainly is a skilled lawyer. Mr. Strength can then come up here and can say, well, she said it was the 31st of October, but she didn't, did she? She never said that it was the 31st of October. When questioned very courteously by Mr. Gunn, again, about what date really was it, she said, I don't know. When Mr. Gunn asked her, where was the location that she was clear about? Wasn't down by Mr. Avery's trailer at all. It was one of these cars that, that's parked at the corner that are for sale. Well, importantly, that excludes, excludes Teresa Hoppe as the person taking this picture. Not only is the time wrong, because we have Bobby Dassey, who doesn't have any questions about what this person looks like, or the time this happened, or that it was before he went deer hunting and knew and was able to recognize that that was Teresa Hobbuck. But we have the defense's own witness saying, I don't know, I don't know the date that this happened. Could have been the first, could have been the second, Mr. Gon said, could it have been a week ago? Yeah, a week before. Could, have, could it have been two weeks before? Yeah. It could have been two weeks before. What does that do? How does that help? As Mr. Strang argued in his closing, do you believe that that's the truth? Or do you believe that that's disingenuous? Again, is that a misrepresentation of what Ms. Buckner actually said? In other words, how does it help? How does it help you? Between Bobby Dassey and Lisa Buckner, who has the better memory? Who was in a position to see what was going on that day? And those kinds of questions you're gonna to need to answer. Same kind of thing with the other lay witness that was called in this case. Some gentleman who was a propane employee, as I understand, who talked about seeing a green mid-sized SUV. Well, ask yourselves, is that a green mid-sized SUV? I will argue no, that's not a green mid-sized SUV. But there's interpretations and there are things that may or may not be important about that. However, it hardly helps the equation. It hardly helps you decide in this case whether or not that was Ms. Hava. In fact, we know it wasn't because Ms. Hava never did leave that property, all right? You need to buckle up here because here's where the absurdity starts. Mr. Puting wants you to believe that some unknown person, somebody that Mr. Puting can't identify, somebody that the defense cannot identify, actually undetected, took one of the four burn barrels belonging to Barb Yanda. Suggested that that theory also includes, by the way, that would take more than one person if you think about it, 55 gallon drum carrying this, we're talking about more than one person. But we're gonna go just for now with Mr. Buting's theory in this case. And that at some remote location, Teresa's burn, that the bones are dumped and that the burn barrel is put back. Mr. Puting doesn't tell you though, are the eight or nine steps in between that you as a jury have to find as fact in order to kind of buy this, okay? When somebody is trying to sell you something and when you decide whether or not you're gonna buy that, you should understand all of the steps that you have to buy. You have to buy that they could, first of all, take one of these barrels undetected. All right. Next, that they have Teresa Hobbach lying dead somewhere. Whoever this is has Teresa already lying dead in some remote location. And rather, rather than dispose of Teresa Hobbach, if they were inclined to do so, at that remote location, 
Mr. Buting is asking you to believe that she's burned, that her body is mutilated, that her body is then loaded, apparently, into this 55-gallon drum of barbianda that has been stolen. It's a theft that's been someone secreted off the property. What you are then being asked to believe is that they load it back on whatever vehicle it is that they are able to transport Ms. Habak after, remember, the at least hour and a half to two and a half hours at 1600 degrees that it takes to fully cremate a body that they load all of these remains. And rather than dumping them someplace else, they bring them back to the very place that Stephen Avery, on the day that Teresa Habak was killed, had a big fire. And they decide to dump the bones. Now, they don't decide to dump all the bones, Mr. Buting's theory goes. They only dump the bones, some of them, and they leave some of them. But interestingly, the ones they dump are the little ones, and the ones they leave in the barrel are the big ones, undetected. But they're able to do this undetected, just a couple of feet from Mr. Avery's trailer. Then, Mr. Buting wants you to believe that they are able to put back the barrel that has been taken off of the property Again, undetected and leave. Now, Mr. Buting called that a plausible explanation. One theory as to how these bones can be in two different places. I hope you agree with me as to the plausibility of that defense theory. Coupled with that theory, what you have to buy into, what you have to believe, is that there is somebody else out there, that there is somebody, not a police officer, all right? So that narrows the scope of people that they're able to do this. Somebody who's not a police officer, who skillfully exploited the law enforcement bias, that the real killer knew about apparently the lawsuit or the animosity, or the embarrassment or something about the 1985 case enough where it was important enough to them to kill some innocent 25-year-old victim and plant it on Mr. Avery's property. That's absurd. If this wasn't such an important decision that you had to make, it would be laughable. It would be something that if somebody told you at a party or somebody told you at your home, you would say nobody would believe that and nobody should. Nobody should believe this series of situations or coincidences that would necessarily lead you to find Mr. Avery not guilty. The SUV was planted in this case or at least the defense will have you believe that the SUV was planted, that somebody planted the SUV. The fact of the matter is that this SUV was concealed. It was obscured. Somebody didn't want it to be found. Let me say that again. What you are looking at right here how the SUV was found by Ms. Sturm was by somebody who didn't want this SUV to be found. All right, that makes sense. Well, if you're going to plant evidence, you have to want it to be found. Because if Mr. Avery is going to be accused of some murder that he didn't do in this case, you would expect to find this vehicle if it was planted in the Avery parking lot or by Mr. Avery's trailer or in some location where it would be found. Again, it was only through happenstance and by very fortuitous intervention that vehicle was ever found. Very important. Collectively, again, 
and using your common sense to understand that concept, that this vehicle was obscured in such a way that whoever put it there, like this, didn't want it to be found. Defense wants you to ignore this, and for good reason. The defense wants you to ignore the electronics that were found in the burn barrel. Why? Because there's no explanation for it. Because it doesn't fit in any, in any theory that the defense has advanced in this case. All right? No law enforcement planting theory. No civilian planting theory. No individual who skillfully exploited the law enforcement bias theory explains why these things are burned in Mr. Avery's burn barrel. And so apparently the defense wants you to ignore that. Well, remember the instruction and reasonable doubt is not, is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, but in consideration of the evidence, which means all of the evidence in this case, not just some of it. So my point, ladies and gentlemen, is if you are going to buy into one of these theories, you've got to ask yourself collectively, what the heck is this? Her phone, her PDA, her camera are all found about 20 feet from Mr. Avery's door. And he is found that day burning in that particular barrel. If Mr. Avery is not involved in the death and mutilation of Teresa Hubbard, then why are these things in that barrel? Also, you can't ignore the fact, please collectively remember that after 2.41 p.m., after 2.41 p.m. on the 31st, Teresa Halbach's phone is never used again. Never used again. Her phone is in that burn barrel. Her phone is being burned. And you, as the jury, have to decide why. There's a couple of explanations. One is that the defendant killed her and burned it. And the other one, I guess, the defense wants you to just come up with on your own. That brings me to the conclusion, or the last question, and that's, did the cops kill Teresa Hoppe? Again, the defense says no. But if the cops had her blood, if the cops had her bones, and before the fifth, if the cops knew she was dead, let me say that again. If before the fifth, the cops knew that Teresa Halbach was dead, they were either told that by the real killer or they killed Teresa Halbach. You have to got to be you have got to be willing to accept one of those scenarios. And I don't think you can. And I don't think you should. And I don't think that the evidence points to that at all. Mr. Strain, in his opening statement, promised you what the defense was going to be. Mr. Strain told you that it's no surprise that the blood from an unsecured vial in the box in the clerk's office that Lieutenant Link examined in 2002 ends up in the Toyota. At the start of the case, that's what the defense was. That's what the defense theory was. That's what the defense said their theory of defense and what the evidence was going to show in this case. Vile planting, though, causes some risk. Risk to what I'm characterizing as risk to the defense. Because when you announce that defense, the state gets to meet that defense. We get an opportunity to tell you, the jury, through witnesses, whether or not that's plausible, whether or not that could happen, or whether or not that's implausible. And there's two ways to do that. First, it's the common sense way to do that. The vile planting defense for Mr. Avery and for the defense team is that either Mr. Link or Mr. Colburn got through this door 
All right. They got through a door that they didn't have a key to. And they got through a door that they didn't have the code to. That's the first part of it. The next thing that they are asking you to buy is that they knew that there was a vial someplace in the clerk of court's office sometime between the 3rd and the 5th of November. Now, why do I say the 3rd and the 5th? Because the 3rd is when Teresa is reported missing. Doesn't play the plant evidence to steal a vial of blood before we know that it's going to do any good. And the 5th is when Pam Sturm finds her. So between the 3rd and the 5th, they have to know that this box actually exists. So they also need you to buy that they know that there is a box within the box, that there's a vial of blood inside of that particular box in the clerk's office. They need you to believe, they need you to believe that they get through a door, they have no key, that they have no code, they find a box, that they don't know the existence of, they find the vial that they don't know the existence of, and then they're able to get their hands on that vial of blood. They also need you to believe that nobody sees them do this, that they're able to do that undetected, to secrete it again, to remove it from the clerk of court's office in Manitowoc, to plant the blood, assuming they know how to do that, in six different places. I'm stopping right here because I need to. Because for the defense version to hold any water at all, the van, excuse me, the SUV can't be found yet. They have to plant the blood before it's found. Again, there's only two ways they can do that. Either they kill this 25 year old girl or they found her murdered somewhere else. And if they found her murdered somewhere else, they weren't, then weren't they taking quite a chance? Weren't Mr. Link and Mr. Colburn, if you admit or buy what it is that these two gentlemen are selling, wouldn't you have to agree that they took a chance that this very 25 year old photographer was also last seen alive by that man. My God, they got lucky, didn't they? To go and find the vial of blood, even assuming they knew where it was, that the dead woman that they had in their possession, theoretically, was also the last person to have seen Mr. Avery. It doesn't make sense. All right. That's the common sense way to deal with the vial of blood planting. By the way, because the vial of blood is still in the clerk's office, you have to reverse this process. You have got to get the blood back after we do the planting. We have to get through, again, the door that we have no key to, we have no code to, and into the box, and get this thing secreted back in there undetected with nobody seeing. That's not reasonable. That's not a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubts are for innocent people. Reasonable doubts are things that juries adopt when all the evidence points to that. And this planting, this vial planting defense, even from a common sense standpoint, is absolutely ludicrous. But what we were able to do, what you heard, is scientifically exclude that vial of blood. You heard from Dr. LeBeau, who testified that this blood is loaded with EDTA, and this blood, and this blood, and this blood have no detectable levels of EDTA. And so instead of calling all of these people with keys and with codes, and people in the clerk's office, and who might have seen Lieutenant Link or Colburn or all those kinds of things. Instead of doing it that way, we only had to call one witness who scientifically could tell you 
that there is absolutely no way that that vial of blood was used to plant. In fact, that very question was asked of Dr. LeBeau, the head of the toxicology section or the unit at the FBI. As he said, by a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, this file of blood is excluded. That means it's not it. It's excluded as the source of those three blood stains. Now, why is that important? Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn, as I mentioned earlier, are good, decent, honest cops sworn to uphold the law. Kinds of officers Manitowoc citizens should be proud to have on their police force. They are the kind of guys that you want investigating cases for you for Manitowoc County. And again, they're not just some cops. They're your cops. That's why a Manitowoc jury decides this case. This isn't just two guys. It's Jim Link and it's Andy Colburn. And when you accuse police officers of official misconduct, that's serious business. Mr. Strain correctly predicted that there would be some anger about this issue coming from the prosecution side. And there is. Let me tell you why. Their livelihood, their reputations, their families, Everything in their 20 plus years of law enforcement are on the line when some lawyer accuses them of misconduct. Not just any misconduct, but planting evidence in a murder case, all right? Serious, serious business. And as a representative of the state, as the prosecutor in this case, I'm here to tell you folks that if you're going to allege that some Manitowoc cop is crooked, that some Manitowoc cop committed a crime, you better have something to back it up. And when you don't, and when there's a witness from the FBI who says that didn't happen, these men are owed an apology. Their good name, their reputations need to be restored to them. And Mr. Strang talked about what a guilty verdict or a not guilty verdict may do in this case. A guilty verdict is most importantly attributed to whether or not Mr. Avery committed these horrific acts in these cases. But also the issue of official or police misconduct should be something that angers you just as it angers me. Mr. Buting said that he might have been a little rough on Ms. Colhane, that he owed her an apology. I'm hoping that the comments that have been directed toward Jim Link and toward Andy Colburn at the conclusion of this case are also met with an apology. But what I heard yesterday, what I heard yesterday from Mr. Buting when he suggested that perhaps it was Teresa's lifestyle that contributed to her homicide. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, because she was at some party. What do we know about this party that she was at on Saturday? Or what do we know about some phone calls that she had gotten? Or what do we know about her living arrangements? Did you blame a 25 year old homicide victim? And when you suggest that that victim had some responsibility or something to do with her own demise, you need to be held accountable for that. You need to be taken to task for that. And again, as the prosecutor, I'm expressing my indignance about that. Any suggestion that these good people of the Hobbach family have to endure in listening to Mr. Beauty stand before you and say, what about this woman's lifestyle? Or what about this party? Or what about who she's living with? Is absolutely out of bounds, absolutely improper, and has no place in this case. 
What does have a place in this case is the facts. And now I have come full circle. And at the conclusion of this, my final argument before you, the jurors, you have seen, and should see by now, the stark difference between the state's facts, between our reliance on the facts, and the defense necessarily relying upon speculation. Physical evidence, the DNA evidence, the eyewitness testimony, the scientific evidence, the big fire that Mr. Avery had, common sense all point to one person, and there's a reason for that. As the jury in this case, you have a duty. You have a duty to return what's called a true verdict. You have a duty to search for the truth. I agree with Mr. Strain that you do have a duty in this case, but I disagree with Mr. when Mr. Strain tells you that your finding of guilt in this case is not going to solve the crime. It is. It's going to solve the crime. And I'm here to tell you also, as the prosecutor and collectively, the three of us prosecutors with lots and lots of years of experience are also going to tell you that it will provide closure. It will provide closure for the Hobhock family, at least in the legal sense. And it's in the sense for what you are charged to do and that is to assign responsibility. It's to assign accountability for the death of Teresa Habak. I don't believe it is a difficult decision. It's a complex series of facts, and it is a very, very serious case. But it's not a difficult case. It's not a difficult decision that you have to make because everything in this case pointed toward one person, towards one defendant. I'm thanking you at the conclusion of this case on behalf of the state of Wisconsin and urging you, urging you to follow the court's instructions, to follow the evidence in the case and return verdicts of guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Now, members of the jury, the duties of counsel and the court have been performed. The case has been argued by counsel. The court has instructed you regarding the rules of law which, which you should govern you in your deliberations. The time has now come when the great burden of reaching a just, fair and conscientious decision of the case is to be thrown wholly upon you, the jurors selected for this important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, prejudice or passion. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind and, as upright citizens, to render a just and true verdict, or in this case, just and true verdicts. The following six forms of verdict will be submitted to you concerning the charges against the defendant, Stephen A. Avery. One reading... We, the jury, find the defendant Stephen A. Avery guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in the first count of the information. A second reading. We, the jury, find the defendant Stephen A. Avery not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in the first count of the information. A third reading. We, the jury, Find the defendant, Stephen A. Avery, guilty of mutilating a corpse, as charged in the second count of the information. A fourth reading, we the jury, find the defendant, Stephen A. Avery, not guilty of mutilating a corpse, as charged in the second count of the information. A fifth reading, we the jury, find the defendant, Stephen A. Avery, guilty of possession of a firearm, as charged in the third count of the information. And sixth reading, we the jury find the defendant Stephen A. Avery not guilty of possession of a firearm as charged in the third count of information. It is for you to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of each of the offences charged. You must make a finding as to each count of the information.
Each count charges a separate crime and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged in one count must not affect your verdict on any other count. This is a criminal, not a civil case, therefore before the jury may return a verdict, which may legally be received, the verdicts must be reached unanimously. In a criminal case, all 12 jurors must agree in order to arrive at a verdict. When you return to the jury room, select one of your members to preside over the deliberations. That person's vote is entitled to no greater weight than the vote of any other juror. When you have agreed upon your verdicts, have them signed and dated by the person you have selected to preside. I ask that you return the unsigned verdict forms as well. At this point, I'm going to ask the media folks to shut the audio down because the court is going to be identifying one of the jurors by name. I believe somebody is supposed to signal me once that's been done. Thank you. Members of the jury, as I previously indicated just before the beginning of deliberations, any remaining alternate jurors would be selected. We are now at that point in the trial. The alternate juror will be sequestered separately from the other jurors until deliberations are completed. To be available in the event one of the other 12 jurors becomes unable to complete deliberations. The alternate juror in this case has been determined to be Nancy Stentz. Miss Stentz, with the consent of counsel for both parties, I will be meeting with you shortly in chambers to explain your remaining role in the case. At this time, I will ask the clerk to swear the officer. The jury is excused. Miss Stentz, you will be waiting in the hallway to meet with me. You may be seated. Counsel, if you have to leave the courtroom area, I ask you to keep the clerk's office informed of your whereabouts. The remaining task to attend to is that we had agreed, I think, that all photographs would go to the jury without a request. But since then, I don't remember if I did this on the record or not, but had moved it to exclude some of the exhibits already admitted and photographs of those. I have numbers of them in my briefcase, but they are the handcuffs, leg irons, electrical cords, and as I say, related pictures. So the courts would need to rule on those, because if to be excluded, of course, those photographs ought not go. I recall being informed that I could anticipate the receipt of such a motion. I don't know if I have received it yet, but I was notified of it, and my recollection is that the parties were going to discuss the potential of disputed items of evidence in order to determine whether there would be a stipulation proposed. I don't know that we had much further conversation, so the question may be best put to the states. If I could just have a moment, Judge, I'd be happy to identify those for the court. Exhibit 173, Exhibit 174. 228 and 229. Thank you, Counsel. 228 and 229. Although those are items themselves. Yes. Some of these are photographs and some are the items themselves, and I don't have which is which. All right. 228. 229 has already been withdrawn, I think, as an exhibit. 228 is the other photo that is at issue in the case, and those three photos, then, that have been identified, we have no objection. They be removed from the binder of photos and that the balance of the photos be tendered to the jury at this time. All right, can you give me the numbers of the photos again? Uh, 173, 174, 228, and Mr. Kratz says that 229 already was withdrawn. Right, those are the three exhibits. Then the items themselves are exhibits 203, 204, and 249, those are the actual items. They wouldn't be going back anyway, Judge. Pardon me? The items wouldn't be going back anyway. I understand the motion to be going beyond that. Right, but they, I'm asking that they be excluded. That is, that the court reconsider the ruling and meeting them. Exclude those things as exhibits. I agree, of course, with Mr. Kratz, that these things wouldn't be going to the jury anyway absence or request, but I'm looking to have them excluded at, as evidence altogether. My only hesitation there is, given the stage at the trial on which this is being raised, I take it you are not asking for the same type of further instruction to the jury that they have been withdrawn? I'm not, no. I mean, we would have addressed that issue before closing arguments. 
Does the state have any objection? The only issue, Judge, is if they would ask to see those items, I think that could be addressed at that time. I don't believe that the items themselves, that is the physical items themselves, need to be addressed at this time. Certainly an argument could be made as to the relevance. They are part of the record. And up and until the time that those may be asked for, I believe that request by counsel is premature. Let me ask this. As a defence, with the understanding that both parties agree and these six exhibits have been identified, that is, three photos and three physical items, with the understanding that they will not be sent to the jury, and I believe there is a stipulation that the three photos can simply be withdrawn, is the defence willing to postpone further consideration of its request to withdraw the other exhibits to such time as the jury requests to see them? Uh, sure, because there is, it's true, there is no practical effect other than cleaning up the record, and that can be done any time. So, based on the stipulation of the parties then, items exhibits 173, 174 and 228 are the totals that are withdrawn, and items 203, 204 and 249 will not be sent to the jury room if requested. Uh, that's right. Now, I have to say, I had our exhibit shows 229. I have been told my understanding was that that's already been withdrawn. Let's just confirm that with the clerk. I probably am wrong, but 229, Janet? I didn't show that as withdrawn. It should be. I have no problem with that. All right, 229 then is also withdrawn. Very well. Thank you. Very well. We're in recess. Judge, one other matter. Yes. I don't know what other exhibits you intend to send back to the jury other than the photographs, but certainly we would object to the experts' reports going back. Let me clarify my understanding further. If I understand what the parties are telling me, and I want to make sure I'm not reading too much into it, I'm glad, Mr. Buton, that you brought this up. If the jury requests permission to see any other photos, are the parties saying I can send them back, or the parties wish to be heard before they are sent back? Uh, photos can be sent without jury presence. Right now. Uh, that's what we agreed. You are asking the court to send them back? Right now, yes. Okay. But any other exhibits, if they ask to be seen, we would all like to be heard on that. And maybe we didn't have an agreement on this. I expressed the view to counsel that we also could send CVs for all experts back without request if they are not in agreement. No, that... I'm a little concerned if we're sending all photos, that's one thing. I hate to send back nothing but all CVs and nothing else, for fear that it might draw undue attention to them. So I'm going to wait, and if the jury requests to see anything other than the remaining photos, I will notify the parties, just as I would as I would receive a question from the jury, and the parties will have a chance to be heard before they go back. That sounds good. Fair enough. Thank you, Chad. Yes. All right, we're adjourned for this time.